Um, I'm Shannon Lamaster Smith, and this is Ministry with Gen Z and Gen Alpha. So if you're not here for that, you're not in the right place. Um, but you can stay anyway, because we're welcome to everyone. Um, we're uh, going to keep uh, just sharing an introduction while people keep coming in. I'm going to turn it over to my producer, uh, my lovely husband, um, to explain some of our housekeeping logistics as we experience this virtual workshop together. Thank you, Shannon. I am Jonathan. I'm Jonathan Lamaster Smith, and I am the producer for this tonight. Uh, as you, uh, a few housekeeping things that this is being recorded. So whatever is on your screen may end up on the recording. We are keeping everyone muted in this because there are quite a few people signed up for this. And if everyone unmutes, then it will uh, be just chaotic on the recording. Oft oftentimes, you also find whenever people are not muted, we get lots of feedback on the recordings and don't need all the feedback and static that will come with that as part of that. Uh, if you have questions or thoughts, feel free to uh, drop those questions throughout in the chat. We'll be doing some other interactive things as well as part of the evening. Uh, but overall, just uh, it, enjoy it. It'll be a, a good time and uh, a lot of fun. Excellent. Thank you again for uh, being here um, on this lovely Wednesday evening. Um, this is Ministry with Gen Z and Gen Alpha, and I'm excited to be able to share some of the things that I've learned about these generations and how amazing they are, and you'll actually get to hear from uh, some of them as well. Um, so uh, let's move to the next slide. As we begin, I just want to highlight um, some of the opportunities that we have in the conference uh, to be engaged with Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Um, if you are a youth minister of any kind, paid, unpaid, part-time, full-time, volunteer, um, I invite you to join the Youth Ministry Network. Um, it is a group that we've developed uh, since 2021 that meets in all kinds of different capacities, both online and in person, to support each other, encourage each other, share resources and network um, as we uh, seek to journey along alongside young people. And the newest thing is the Children's Ministry Network. And so that is also getting started. Both of those um, uh, on the screen are links. Uh, so if you look at the document that's in the chat, um, you're actually able to click on those and it'll take you to um, the websites. The conference website also highlights all the different opportunities we have for both the Youth Ministry Network and the Children's Ministry Network. Um, on the top right, you can see a highlight uh, for Ignitus. It's our conference youth event that's in the spring. It is completely youth-led, youth-planned and led. Our conference council on youth ministries plans and leads Ignitus. It's at Camp Haynes, and it is an amazing experience um, that highlights ministry with uh, what, what ministry with Gen Z and Alpha looks like. Um, a few years ago, the, the youth on CCYM decided they did not want a speaker. A traditional youth event would have a speaker and a band. Um, rather, they they wanted to be in charge of the message. Um, and that just gives you a glimpse into uh, Gen Z and Gen Alpha. They want to be involved. They want to lead now. And so uh, at last year, we started uh, with CCYM. They created some creative proclamation experiences to highlight our topic for the weekend. And they're going to do the same uh, at Ignitus this year. So it's an amazing experience. Um, to really see what uh, ministry with Gen Z and Alpha looks like. Right below that is also a link to some youth mental health resources. Again, just some concrete um, help for mental health resources um, as our youth these days are in great need of those. And then again, the learn more learning opportunities, all of that, there are links in the document that was shared in the chat. So there's just some of the things that are going on. Um, an overview, next slide, of our session to this evening is going to be uh, sharing an overview of the generations, um, the making of Gen Z and Alpha and how things have changed over the years, some of the characteristics of Gen Z and Alpha, and we'll get to hear from some Gen Z um, youth and young adults to share about uh, their experience and what they would like for you to know. And then the implications for ministry with Gen Z and Alpha. So that's our overview for the session. I do invite you to ask questions in the chat or to um, utilize the chat to say hello. If you see somebody that you recognize in uh, this workshop, feel free to say hello. Um, and we will be utilizing the annotate 
um, feature of Zoom, which we're going to practice in just a minute. Next slide. So first, I would like to share um, some of the sources that have led me to um, all of the things that I'm going to be sharing in this in this workshop. And here is where I'd like for you to practice using the annotate. So I'm going to go over that real fast. Um, on your screen, um, Jonathan you, uh, is sharing his screen. And at the top of your screen, it says you are viewing Jonathan Lamaster Smith's screen. Next to that, to the right, you'll see view options. And you want to click that. And then three pieces down from that is called annotate. And what that's going to do is bring to the left side of your screen um, a series of things. And I want you to click on this check mark, which is a stamp. Um, you can change the stamp uh, to be a check mark, an arrow, an X a heart, a star, and I want you to just practice by, you can see me doing this, putting it anywhere you want to on the screen. Um, so we're gonna practice uh, annotating the screen as I share about the resources. <laughs> so as you can see, um, McCrindle and Pew are some research organizations that focus on um, social issues and demographics. Um, I learned the word futurist because the McCrindle person that started that is a futurist. He predicts um, the future based on the trends over the years. And I find that very fascinating. Um, the McCrindle person is the one who coined the term Gen Alpha. So I found that to be curious. Um, so there's just some of the research organizations that I've pulled from and some of the demographics um, uh, visuals that you'll see are from McCrindle. On the right hand side are two organizations that um, Fuller is a very a heavily based in research. They do a lot of research with the younger generations. They've put out multiple research projects such as Sticky Faith, that was many years ago, um, to show that each young person needs five adults who care about them in their lives. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of stuff that came out of Sticky Faith. Uh, also, um, the Growing Young uh, Research, which was how to help churches grow younger and some helpful practices for how to do that. And then Orange um, is, in my opinion, what uh, Youth Specialties has kind of morphed into, totally different organization, um, but practical help for youth workers and children's workers. Um, they have a conference each year um, and then regional uh, trainings throughout the year, and they're a great organization. Um, for providing curriculum and resources for youth and children's ministers. On the bottom left, you'll see uh, podcast, webinar, and books. Um, some of the resources that you'll see in the document, uh, again, that link for the document is in the chat. Um, you'll see some of the podcasts and webinars that, um, that I've pulled from for this research. Uh, one is the Rethinking Youth Ministry podcast, which is out of Orange. They do really great work. Um, to highlight just rethinking how um, youth ministry uh, works. Webinars, um, I attended several last year. I love webinars, it's a great way to learn, especially if you don't wanna hear this part of the segment, you can fast forward to where the meat of where you wanna hear is, that is fine. Um, but practical resources for churches and Vibrant Faith are always putting out really good uh, webinars. Um, and then books, the two that I'm highlighting that I'm reading with our youth and children's ministry networks now are Faith Beyond Youth Group. Uh, that is out of Fuller. It's the latest research from Fuller. Um, and then Holy Work with Children. Um, and that is by Tanya Eustace Campen. Really good stuff um, that highlights ministry with our youngest generations. And then the bottom right is just my personal experience. I grew up in the United Methodist Church. My dad was a youth director, and so church was just a second home for me. Um, and I've, uh, everywhere we moved, it was a place that we f found a sense of grounding so that even though we moved different places, church was always a sense of, of grounding for me and a sense of identity. I went to Pfeiffer University. That's where I met my husband. Um, and I, I, minored, I majored in Christian ed and music there. So Pfeiffer uh, brought up a whole uh, multiple generations of, of Christian educators, fabulous work there. Um, and then I am an ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church. So that's a little bit of my background. Um, my husband and I live in Hildebrand, which is between Hickory and Morganton. Um, we have three dogs and a cat <laughs> and live a very simple life. So um, that is a little bit about some background for resources for this presentation. Again, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat if you have any. We're gonna clear those annotations and move on to the next slide.
Excellent. So we're going to put a poll out to all of you who are here um, to see which generation you belong to. I put one in the Whova um, app to see uh, of all the participants in Whova what generations uh, people belong to. You can see kind of the the years that highlight each of those. Um, incidentally, of the 40 people who had responded to the poll uh, the right before this uh, webinar started, there were no Gen Z or Gen Alpha represented. Um, and that is an, a typo in the poll. It should be Gen X at the very bottom. But as you see here, similar to the demographics of um, the one in the Whova app, um, we don't we don't have any Gen Z or Alpha represented, which some of you might think, well, they're so young, but they are still part of the church now and capable of uh, growing in their leadership skills and participating in something like this. Um, I have some thoughts about why they might not be involved, but uh, very curious. And I uh, think we're going to end that poll. Um, well, we still have a few more people to participate in the poll um, and uh, share those results with you. I can see them. I'm not sure if you can yet. As people are filling out the poll, you can also put in the chat uh, as a way of introducing your generation. What was a word that your generation used to say something was cool? <laughs> cool. <laughs> Mine, I remember the word fat, P-H-A-T. Totally rad. I see off the chain. Bangerang. Rad. Far out. Okay. The bomb, right? Groovy. Awesome. All <laughs> that and a bag of chips. Love that. We're going to share these results of the poll so you guys can see of the people responded in the poll, you can see what the breakdown is. Can't remember that far back to know what was cool. So here's a little uh, quiz to see how much you know Gen Z or Gen Alpha. Um, what is something that this generation uses, use, what language do they use to say something is cool? And as you're sharing about that, um, you'll see on the slide, again, this document is uh, in the chat. That will take you, um, the Gen Z, how Gen Z are you, to a, a super fun quiz to see how familiar you are with uh, Gen Z. There's all kinds of strange things on there. But okay, so what does this generation say to cool to say something is cool? Bussin', lit, dope, slaps, awesome. They don't say it, they text it or make a face, right? tough. You can go to the next slide. So when I first uh, started looking at uh, the language that Gen Z uses um, and hearing it and then trying to make sense of it, um, you can see a word cloud on the right there of all the, the strange words that this generation uses. And I started to panic. Um, if you Google um, Gen Z slang, uh, you'll find some things come up um, and and, and it's looks it looks like you're looking at a completely different language. And I started to panic. I'm like, do I, I do I, I have to learn this new language? Like I don't even know how to pronounce some of those words, but I love my youth. And so I'm like, what what is my role as a youth leader? Am I supposed to know um, how to like when to use those words and what if I get it wrong? Like what's gonna happen? And so here's what I learned. You don't need to know all of those words or what they even mean because you can always ask. Um, I would simply ask my youth, what do you mean when you say um, high key or, or um, uh, let's see, flex? Or like, I've heard you say this or that. Um, can you explain like what you mean when you say that? And they'll tell you, they'll tell, they might laugh at you a little bit, but they'll tell you what it means. Um, I don't think that they expect you to use all of those words because they're not looking to you as an adult in their life 
to mimic them or to be like them. They're looking to you to be an adult in their life who cares about them. Um, and even though it might mean understanding what some of those mean, they're not necessarily expecting you to use all of those words. And as we know from youth culture in general, once adults start using the words or practices of the youth culture, it, the youth culture changes because the whole thing is meant to be subversive and kind of like a little off. Um, so that so the disclaimer here um, is when in doubt, talk it out. Don't be afraid to ask questions of, of young people to try to seek to understand um, and approach with a with a sense of curiosity about what they're talking about, what they mean uh, with what they're talking about. Um, but my disclaimer is in all of the things we're going to learn about the generations, they're all generalities and nothing, nothing replaces that personal interaction with young people and getting to know them um, authentically and genuinely in person uh, to journey alongside them, to really get to know who they are, not who people say that they are. Because I know as a geriatric millennial, um, there were many things said about my generation that I did not appreciate or identify with. Um, and so I'm sure that you all have had similar situations and so my disclaimer is, is, is really an invitation, um, and that is to get to know young people, not assume things about them based on what people say about them. Um, nothing replaces that personal relationship. So if you don't remember anything else from this webinar, get to know a young person genuinely and care about them. Next slide. So um, we're going to seek to understand a little bit about how um, the generations are. are. Um, and the first thing we're going to look at is history. Now, I have never been really been into history, um, but as I've uh, heard things about Gen Z and Alpha and the frustration that adults especially have with them, um, it dawned on me that there, there's a reason that um, there's this disconnect between the generations. And a lot of it has to do with all of the historical events that have happened between, if you look at the beginning of Gen Z, 1995, and now. I first heard about Gen Alpha at a National Young People's Gathering uh, two years ago, and the facilitator had us name all of the historical events, all everything that happened, technology creations and everything from the year 2000 to now. And so you can name in the chat if you'd like all of the things that have happened between the year 2000 and now. Um, a lot has happened. Um, I didn't even have a cell phone in the year 2000. I don't think I got one until I was 18. Um, and so that was a new development. 9-11 was a huge event that happened. Um, Facebook, MySpace, yep, social media, several major economic crises, um, streaming services, COVID, right? And so all of uh, the, the, the article um, here from, I believe it is Orange or Fuller, not sure which one, um, is that every generation experiences unique moments in history that impact how they see the world and their potential for success. Um, so thinking about all of the global events, the economic health, um, the technolo technologies that have been invented and cultural trends, um, things are very different now than when we were, were young. Um, and I include myself in that. And I think that we as, as adults assume that young people have the same um, understanding about how things are as we do, but that, that is not the case. We cannot assume. Um, we know, because I can say we because there are no uh, Gen Alpha or Z in here, we know a world before 9-11. Um, we know what happened when 9-11 happened and the, and the country came together across political divides. That is not the world that we live in right now. There is so much division now. That is what the young people know to be normal. We know that things can be different, but they don't know any different. Um, I have a colleague who teaches music in the schools, and he said, it's as if chaos is the language of young people. And it's very true because chaos is the world that they were born into. Um, di disconnect is the world that they were born into. Political tension and divide is the world that they were born into. And so they don't necessarily know how different things can be. Um, unless, of course, they have older people in their life to help um, tell them stories, the importance of story. 
um, to help them understand like things don't have to be this way. Things can be different. Um, and so a question that you might include in the chat is what historical events Im events impacted you when you were 11 to 20 years old? And with that, we can move to the next slide. One of the research pieces from Pew um, on the next slide to the left is this uh, question that they asked um, people name the top 10 historical events that um, that you think may have the greatest impact um, on the country. And you can see there are some similarities there um, across the generations, obviously. 9-11 um, uh, was one of those things. The Obama election was one of those things. Again, I think a lot of it comes down to exposure. Uh, young people today are exposed to so much more than what even I was exposed to. I didn't have a TV in my room growing up. Um, I didn't have a TV in my room till I went to college, in fact. And so um, my, uh, I know young people who have had TVs in their room since they were like six or seven years old. Um, who have had iPhones or tablets in front of their faces as if they were a pacifier. Um, we were given pacifiers when we were babies, but a lot of times um, young people are given a device to look at, a screen to watch. Um, and so the exposure that they've had is so different than what we have had. And so we have to take all of that into consideration, right? Why does any of this matter? And you're welcome to put in the chat um, the answer to the question, what historical events do you think that Gen Alpha and Gen Z will say most affected them? Um, and obviously COVID is a huge one um, for that. Uh, COVID hit at the formation development uh, socially uh, for so many young people. And um, we will it, it will take some time to know the impact of that. But youth leaders you know, and children's ministers report already that language is a struggle. Um, the ability to um, communicate, uh, interpersonal communications is a struggle um, because in those formative years, they, they, they wouldn't necessarily have that unless there was some intentionality about creating it. Um, so that, that'll be an interesting thing to, to pay attention to. But why does this matter? I think the important thing to note, again, is we cannot assume that they have the same um, historical memory that we do. We have to have empathy. Um, and understanding that chaos is the world that they were born into. Um, and so we have a gift to offer in, in the sense of providing some sense of calm, some sense of grounding, um, teaching them and sharing stories about how things can be can be different. Um, but it's really all a call to to practice empathy and understanding for for what they're going through. If uh, instead of complaining or judging about them always being on their phone, recognize again that that is, uh, somewhat of a coping mechanism for them, much like I carry around my, um, I think I've, I've heard it called a, an emotional support water bottle, um, because there is an element of like comfort in having this um, with me as an appendage, just like their phones are for them. Um, but technology is definitely uh, one of those things that has changed over time, again, with history. Um, it used to be that uh, we all watched TV together in the living room as a family, um, I know mine did every Thursday and Friday night. We were in the um, the living room together, but now everybody's separated in their own little rooms watching their own uh, screens. Um, technology used to be something that we would go to um, and then disconnect from, um, but now it is literally another appendage that we, that we live with. Um, and so the function uh, and the influence of technology has changed our brain chemistry, um, and all kinds of other things. Um, we now, we don't just use a phone to call people anymore, obviously. We use it for all kinds of things. I use it to pay bills and to check my bank account. I pick my phone based on the quality of the camera to take pictures everywhere I go. And even though I've tried to disconnect from using my phone, especially when I'm around people, I carry it to take pictures. So it's because it, it's a camera for me. Um, so it's hard to it's harder to disconnect um, from the technology. And again, um, we as adults are quick to judge that because we know a life that's different from that where we could disconnect um, more easily. But now um, it's harder to do that. And so it's all a call to to empathy and a deeper understanding of what um, young people experience. Next slide. 
So this is one of the um, visual demographics from McCrindle. It's very overwhelming. I acknowledge that. I just want to highlight two things on this, um, this graphic, and it is the top left side um, of, of where it says infective, effective engagement. And this highlights how the generations have changed, um, specifically in the ways that people learn. Um, it used to be, uh, you can see Gen X over there, um, was was more verbal, but now it's more everything is more visual. It used to be that a teaching style might be to sit and listen, but now it's to try things out to, and to see, to experiment with them. Teachers used to be uh, standing in front of a group talking at them, but now it is more that teachers are more of a facilitator. Um, and you, you can see uh, several other of those things where you things used to be curriculum centered, but now it is learner centric. Um, where it's, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, it does in, in some ways, but it doesn't necessarily matter what curriculum you're using, but it's more of the process of, of learning and focusing on the different ways that people learn. Um, it, uh, let's see. Yeah, it used to be uh, that, pe that as a part of your uh, school supplies, you needed books and paper, but now you need a computer or a device. And that's very, di very different. Um, my kids would report to me all the time uh, what they did at school, their teacher just had them watch videos to learn um, instead of actually uh, teaching in front of them. Um, and then the one right under that is leadership change. And that's also important to highlight. Things used to be where a leader would oversee a group of people. It was a very top-down approach. But now it's about collaboration um, and contribution. Young people want to be involved in the planning and implementation of things. Um, they don't just want to be told what to do. They want to be part of a solution. And that is an, a, that is an amazing gift of this generation is that they can see things in a different way because they're not, um, because they don't have the same history, historical memory that we do. Um, and so they're not as limited in the potential for uh, what things can be like. And it is so exciting to problem solve with uh, Gen Z and Alpha because their their imagination is unlimited and they they can see things that even I cannot and um, it has been very humbling I will say um, when I feel like there isn't a solution and they're like well how about this and I, I had not thought of that before and so this is why we we have to involve young people now so um, all of these dem uh, graphics are free um, if you go to McCrindle, um, I have two more I think we're going to look at. You can go to the next one. Um, and so you can you can peruse them all more deeply uh, later. Uh, so we've talked about language. We've talked about technology. We've talked about effect, effective engagement, which we'll get to more in a little bit. Um, leadership style. This is kind of just a fun graphic to look at. And you feel free to post in the chat, like, what are some of the things that you see in this graphic that are that are uh, kind of a fun or unique to mention beyond the slang terms there's toys how toys have changed anybody see anything else to note music devices again learning styles very different. The influence uh, section at the very bottom is, is also very interesting. Um, it used to be that there was all authority given to an official or an expert, but now everything's online. And so they look to chatbots for, for influence. Um, I mean, how many times do we ask Google the answer to a question instead of trying to find um, an expert in the field to answer it for us? And we trust the Google the Google answer. Um, so that's that's also an interesting thing. So again, you are uh, welcome to look at this and uh, more in depth on your own. I just wanted to highlight some of the differences between the generations in a somewhat fun way. Next slide. I think is going to go into more depth on Generation Alpha, and this is where, <laughs> I you know, research uh, can be biased. We have to acknowledge that, and um, you know, <laughs> you can look at the numbers and you can look at all the things on this graphic, 
um, and ask some questions about how they how they got to this. And um, McCrindle is based out of Australia. Um, and so, but the, the funny thing that, that kind of just made me laugh was the top baby names. Um, incidentally, uh, our nephew is named uh, Jack Oliver, which on a different slide, Jack is where Noah is. The top baby names are Charlotte, Olivia, Noah, William, but the top countries of birth are India, China, and Nigeria. Now I'm pretty sure they're not naming their daughter Charlotte. Um, so there's that. <laughs> but so you can see the weekly number of births. They say that by the time Generation Alpha is done um, being born, they will be the largest generation alive. Um, so with the rapid growth in, in the birth rate for Generation Alpha. The other thing to highlight on this slide is the top left, what shaped them. Um, our millennial parents, all the things that people said about millennials, well, they're now parents. So there are many different parenting styles um, that come with that. Um, yep. Okay. So someone's saying they grew up going to the library and using encyclopedias and today it's Google and TikTok. Um, sure. Again, you can ask all the critical questions you want about this research. I encourage that. Um, so some of the characteristics that they name that are important to highlight are th that global. Um, so again, with technology, um, the exposure to global trends and influences um, create a more global culture, or at least exposure to all kinds of different things that we did not have when we were growing up. Um, social, again, using all kinds of social media. I uh, My guilty pleasure is playing board games online. And I play board games online with people from all over the world. Um, and we're able to talk about how things are going in different parts of the world. Um, but we're playing, you know, Connect Four or Catan or whatever else. And so um, that's uh, an interesting aspect where we used to be separated because we didn't have the internet. Now um, there's a lot more uh, cross-cultural influences uh, to note. Um, the other thing, obviously, we've noted, and it's on there, too, is that Generation Alpha is the COVID generation, and we're still going to be learning for some time what that means, um, but especially around social skills uh, and health, mental health issues is, is huge. Um, the other thing I love, uh, I read an article about Generation Alpha, I think, and Gen Z, and it referenced how they are not um, content consumers anymore as much as they are content creators and producers. And so what does that mean for our ministries? Um, I, uh, my youth would come to me and show me videos all the time of that they had made at home. Um, and so they love to produce and to create content. That's exciting. Um Again, millennial parents, uh, I think it was in Glennon Doyle's book, she references how you used to have a baby and then be sent home and say, good luck. Um, and now when you have a baby, there's like this humongous guidebook that everybody gives you and it's all different, full of all kinds of different things, which creates increased anxiety around parenting and judgment around parenting that didn't used to be uh, as prominent. Um, so that's huge. Um, parents are more involved than they used to be, which again, considering youth and children's ministries um, is, uh, is, is something to be mindful of because parents are a lot more involved um, and responsive as things happen in different ways. Um, whereas it used to be parents might laugh something off. Um, now they will be more intent about pointing things out that are important to them and the values that they have. They're much more involved because millennials are all about pointing out their values and wanting things to be a certain way. So um, that's that's important to note. And then again, all of this, all of this change <laughs> is overwhelming, right? Just They're overwhelmed. Life is a lot for a lot of people right now. And so this is all a call to empathy and greater understanding about what people are going through in life, um, all the changes that are happening um, and, and, how to, and asking the question and discerning um, how is God calling us to respond to all of this? Next slide. Oh, sorry. The next uh, slide we have is actually hearing from some of our youth and young adults um, that represent Gen Z. Oh, 
So you can skip that. I'll come back to it. Hi, my name is Joseph Navarro, and I'm a member of Harrison United Methodist Church in Pineville, North Carolina. I am currently a junior in college, uh, attending Wofford College. I am involved in many ways, both in the local church and as well as here in the conference. I have the pleasure of serving as one of the lay delegates to the jurisdictional conference, but also have the pleasure of serving on the conference council youth ministries, which I've been doing since I was in about 10th grade in high school. And at this point, in the I serve in the capacity as just like being an adult there to help uh, the youth and guide them in the direction that they wish to go. One thing I would like the church to know about my generation is that we are eager. Eager to learn, eager to grow, and eager to be part of the church. We have to be given the opportunities to learn. We have to be given the opportunities to grow. We have to be given the opportunities to be part of the church. We need guidance. We need guidance from the church of today. We need guidance from the church of yesterday so that we can be the church of tomorrow. One hope I have for the United Methodist Church is strength. Strength for us to continue, strength for the future, and strength so that we can continue to be united. Here are some written testimonies from various youth who serve on CCYM and some young adults that I'm going to go over with you and highlight some of the things that they've said. Uh, first one is an 11th grader at the early college at Guilford. He's involved in his church through youth group, youth leadership team, audiovisual team, uh, and participates in a multitude of ways. He would like the church to know that our my generation, that's Gen Z, really needs ways to be able to participate and show leadership within the larger church, not just within youth programs. Uh, we need more opportunities to participate in the larger congregation and be able to see our place in the church as we continue to grow up and grow in our faith. One hope that he has for the United Methodist Church is that youth can be more integrated into the church and the conference level. Another uh, one, a senior at Page High School, she is involved in her church in a multitude of ways and is our secretary for CCYM. She would like the church to know that my generation, Gen Z, wants to feel loved and accepted. Um, she says, uh, unfortunately, the church uh, is not that for many people uh, because the world is plagued by negativity, division, and hatred. Um, the church can be a safe place, and that is her dream, is that the United Methodist Church would lead by example. Um, she says, G Gen Z is all about finding your people and making a life for themselves in which they feel completely loved and accepted, not only for the person they are today, but the person they will grow to become. Um, she says our goal is to expose them to God's love, but we have to allow them to do what they want with it. Um, so that is uh, some really great stuff there. Um, she says it's our duty to make each and every person, including those within Gen Z, feel welcome and able to follow Jesus and surround them with his love. Another young adult, a, a member of Central UMC in Albemarle, she thinks that her generation, Gen Z, often feels disconnected from the church today. We don't necessarily want a concert on Sunday mornings, but we also don't necessarily feel like rituals or reciting creeds or prayers in every service brings us closer to our relationship with Jesus. One hope that she has, this is beautiful for the Amethyst Church, is to be is to build a bridge between uh, traditional and contemporary ways of worship or practice. Uh, she says, my generation is hungry not only for a relationship with Jesus, but also to feel connected to a community of believers who walk with Jesus because it's what they genuinely want to do and not a weekly ritual. So those are some words from Gen Z. So I put in the chat, what are some of the things that you heard in those testimonials? So we have some of the answers uh, that they wanna be included and accepted, that they're craving opportunities to serve in meaningful roles within the church, not siloed to an encouragement to allow younger people to have a ministry to do in the congregation. They want us to change the paradigm. What are some other things that you noticed? One of the things, and I hear a lot uh, in, in relation to the last um, statement, 
is there's an assumption that younger people want flashing lights and um, entertainment and uh, that they prefer contemporary worship. And that's just not true. Um, I know several families, um, my brother's family included, that prefers in a traditional experience. Um, more than traditional versus conservative, exactly, um, Laura, they want authenticity. They want to see something real. Um, they can spot fake a million miles away. Um, they want and crave genuine um, authenticity, not a perfectly crafted worship experience without a hitch, um, but maybe something that's a little raw um, because it's real. Um, again, they're used to creating content all the time and it's not perfect. And they laugh at themselves. Um, it's silly. Uh, and that's that's OK. Um, I think we need to be incorporating play more in our worship in general. Um, they want a substance versus form. Absolutely. Um, exactly. They uh, People in the, in the chat right on. They want to engage in discussion, and not be preached at. Exactly. Again, that's what our conference council and youth ministry um, discerned last year. They uh, amazed me and terrified me. <laughs> that's what they'll do. And by saying we don't want a speaker, we don't want some stranger coming in and talking at us. Um, we want to hear from other youth and our peers. We want to learn from each other. Um, they want to engage the, the content together. And so as a deacon, I'm all about creative proclamation and using multiple intelligences and the different ways that people learn to explore scripture and to learn um, and to share our reflections with each other. Um, and so, yes, Lauren, you're saying when, the, when their whole lives uh, are curated and polished authenticity, is refreshing. Authenticity will go a long way. We're going to look at that a little more um, in just a minute. So yeah, thank you for these testimonies um, from several young adults and youth in our conference. We're going to, um, they inspired me so much when they shared these that um, I want to to do more of that. I think we all need more of that and sharing their hopes and dreams for the future. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Next slide. Um, these next Hi. slides, uh, or our um, uh, graphics that I had put together um, back in the fall because I kept hearing the same things over and over in the books that I was reading and the in the podcasts and webinars that I was listening to um, in in my own ministries um, that I that, and then and, and listening to youth and children's workers all over the conference Um these are the things that everybody is saying and um, that and that in other parts of the country, which are ahead of the South in a lot of ways, um, have been leaning into more fully. Um, and so I want you to use the annotate button um, the feature. Again, if you go to the top of your screen to view options and then annotate. Um, and I want you to uh, put a question mark next to ones that you would like for me to elaborate on. And then put a heart next to ones um, that you're like, yes, this. Um, so that'll help give me some uh, insight on what you would like to hear more about. Um, but we've already talked about the first one a little bit, which is, again, that more than, I mean, being entertained, that was a that was a 90s youth ministry model that arguably wasn't good then. But just because fashion is coming back from the 90s does not mean that that trend needs to. Um, what young people crave is authenticity more than entertainment or attractional, um, being real with each other. Um, again, I, I struggle with work with the lingo and with I'm not into pop culture as much as like my husband is and so I'm like I, you know I don't know what they're talking about here it's okay to not know you don't have to know um being real is more important to them um than than knowing all of the pop references and again that opens the door for conversation which um also in the document at the end one of the sources if you do want to be more aware of pop culture and what's going on in the lives of young people axis axis um is a is a parent resource but if really for anyone trying to understand um pop culture references when it relates to young people and that what i like about them is that they always end with a conversation starter. And so it's all meant to um, invite conversation around those topics. Okay, so I'm seeing a question about intergenerational. So yes, traditionally um, the church has 
siloed by age. Um, we have separated everyone out into their own little Sunday school classrooms, and that has prevented um, some deep experiences of learning from the, across, and across the generations. Um, uh, again, like an older model was to, to have a separate youth building instead of and like go over there, kind of get out of the way instead of saying, no, like come be with us. Um, smaller churches um, do intergenerational ministry so much better um, because they they don't have the capacity. Um, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing to have a separate thing for youth or children. A lot of times their learning is all together. And that is so good because as we share stories, and hear from one another, we, um, our, our, our imaginations are open and our, um, our capacities for learning and seeing things in different ways um, are, are much richer. Um, so intergenerational is definitely, uh, has, has been for a while a growing trend in the church. Um, we were in Chicago for three years while my husband is getting his PhD, and um, they're definitely ahead of, of trends in the church um, uh, than, uh, as opposed to the South. And intergenerational ministry is definitely um, a growing trend. And, and fortunately, there's there's more resources for that. Um, the diversified, I see a, a question mark there. What I mean by that is um, that a lot of times in, ch in churches, we tend to um, do things just for the people inside the church, um, kind of as a self-sustaining the institution mechanism. Rather, um, things really need to be more diversified. We need to keep um, mindful of all the different people, um, both in the church that are, may not be present, but also um, the community and getting outside of uh, the church. And so, yes, doing ministry in many places, um, not just sitting in your office waiting for people to come to you, um, but going out to where people are. Um, this is where like Fresh Expressions does a really great work with uh, diversifying the way that people worship, um, the, diversifying the way that people learn, um, and not just doing things the same way we've always done them. Asynchronous, such a great word. Um, I learned this word when my husband started teaching online and some of his class and I started taking classes online. Some of classes online are um, where you show up to a webinar like this and it's over and you're done. Um, but some are asynchronous. They all happen kind of like our conference has been happening all week through Whova, where it's asynchronous. You log, log on and talk with people at different times when it's convenient for you. Um, asynchronous uh, can work in the church as well. We experienced this with COVID where uh, many of our children's and youth leaders praise God for all of these amazing people, um, found ways to engage with families for spiritual formation and Bible study um, and when we couldn't come together. Unfortunately, some of that has stopped and it doesn't need to stop. People still need um, asynchronous forms of worship and spiritual formation and learning. Um, and so that just means more than just Sundays um, or uh, uh, in other, other times of the week um, when people are able to engage, not just um, expecting people to come one day a week for, you know, one or two hours. Um, people, again, lives are busy. They're, they have uh, things going on where sometimes their only family they, time they have is on a Sunday morning. And so that doesn't, that's not a bad thing. That means that we need to be engaging them beyond Sunday mornings. Um, we cannot expect them to to come to us. We need to go where they are. And yes, apps like Discord has, has made um, this even more possible. Checkpoint Church is amazing to have, be able to have um, all kinds of different engagement um, through Discord, um, worship, learning, uh, missions, all kinds of super awesome stuff going on there. Um, earned trust has a question mark next to it. So yes, it used to be, again, that we all put our trust in a leader, um, the person in charge, usually a white man. And now it's it's not like that. We need, we, we have, um, we, people need to earn the trust um, in order to uh, have influence. Um, and that, that trust can fade away if you don't follow through with something that you've said you're going to do. We know this, right? So if someone says they're going to do something and they don't do it, we tend to like lose trust in them. Um, and yet 
uh, and, and didn't always used to be that way. We would just make excuses for them. Um, but now it's some would call it cancel culture, but some would say, you know, you have to prove that you, you know, you are who you say you are. It goes back to authenticity and having integrity. Um, and that is an expectation that people have now, especially younger people, um, that you do what you say you're going to do. Um, otherwise, like, no. Um, so earning trust, I will say that, um, both faith beyond youth group and holy work with children, um, talk a lot about cultivating trust. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that in a minute. Um, the next slide is, so what does this mean, right? You're here for the concrete stuff. Um, those are the trends. What does that mean? Like, what is something that actionable that I can do from this? Um, so the next slide is ministry practices. Um, these are things that I invite you to stop doing um, and things that you try. And so I think the experimenting is, and again, I invite you to annotate on here, things you want to me to elaborate on with a question mark um, and things that you're like, yes, uh, with a heart. Um, experimenting. So one of the ways that we kind of get out of a rut um, is to try something new, right? Um, I, I usually order the same thing at the restaurants that I go to. You could say that's holding on to the past. Um, but uh, recently, you know, I, I tried something new and it was also good. And I was like, okay, so I don't just have to get the same thing over again. Um, I think some of you might've been at um, annual conference a few years ago when I got up and said, um, Bishop and members of annual conference, I have a confession to make. I... Um, love Duke's mayonnaise. <laughs> um, all my life, my dad told me that Hellman's mayonnaise was the only mayonnaise we could ever have. And if you ate anything else, then it wasn't real and had just like, you know, uh, limited uh, how we, you know, our mayonnaise intake. And so but I learned over, over time that like when I tried Duke's mayonnaise, I loved it. Um, experimenting with new things, it, meaning that you don't have to commit to a new thing forever. It doesn't have to be forever. You can do it for a short period of time. Um, let's try this for a month. Um, let's try this for three months um, and see how that goes and evaluate it regularly. And that will help us move on um, from the past. Again, I see a question mark to going where people are. <sighs> we cannot expect people to come to us. People are busy. People are overwhelmed with life. Um, they have lost faith in the church as an institution. Their trust has been lost for various reasons. Um, one of the, the research pieces, I think it was in Faith Beyond Youth Group, um, was that it was something, I don't want to quote a, a number because I'll get it wrong. A large percentage of young people, uh, no one reached out to them throughout COVID. And so are they going to go back to the church? Probably not. Um, because it showed that nobody cared about them enough to reach out to them throughout COVID. Whereas I started to hear stories about youth ministries that were going well still after COVID and that were going well through COVID, mine included. And I wondered what about those ministries were different? And it's because we engaged with people beyond, you know, even when we couldn't be together in person, we didn't expect them to come to us. We went to where they are. Um, they're not, they're not necessarily going to come on a Sunday morning. Uh, I'm sorry. That's, that's bad news. We can grieve that. We can have spaces to lament that and we can move on and invite the Holy Spirit to help us discern, um, what, where we can go next, where people are. Um, if they're not there on a Sunday morning, engage them in conversation to see where, where are they? Um, with that empathy and curiosity, will engage people and help cultivate that trust to where you understand their life a little more and are able to then respond out of that in Christian love. Um, let's see some other questions here. Yes, my favorite. I mean, my least favorite, but my favorite to talk about the transactional teaching model versus wondering and curiosity. Um, um, Jonathan and I were at Pfeiffer University and we had the great um, Reverend Dr. Patty Myers is our professor, and she taught us that there are multiple ways that people learn. And the percentage, uh, the likelihood that people will learn um, increases the more engaged they are in the learning process. Instead of 
talking at someone like I'm doing now, um, engaging them and wondering and curiosity, like, let's look at this, this graphic and invite your um, impressions of it. What, are, what, what thoughts are coming to your mind as you look at this? What stories can you tell that highlight um, what each of these mean? And so instead of uh, me having the knowledge that I'm giving to you that you need to know, um, treating uh, education and learning as a process, a journey that you are on together. We are exploring the Bible together. Um, I might know a little more about it than you, but it, but I'm still learning about it with you. And we can explore it together in a way that, um, that involves wondering and curiosity as opposed to me just telling you what to think. Because again, young people today have all of this exposure to social media um, and they're constantly discerning what truth is. We all are, right? We, we see multiple news headlines that seem to contradict each other. So what is the truth anymore? It used to be a lot more concrete. It used to be a lot more black and white, but now it's not. And so we need to wonder together and share stories and our own experiences together so we can learn from one another. And that is the way to help young people and all of us really learn more fully as opposed to just telling people what to think. Yes, Godly Play is awesome for elementary age. And there's a lot of different um, modified Godly Play type learning experiences. I've created a few um, that uh, if you go to, well, I can share the link to several of them. Um, but it's uh, it's much more of a participatory learning style as opposed to just one person telling other people what to think. And then, yes, the last one is the question mark on being intentional. Um, we, as a church, put a lot of stuff on the calendar. We used to be very busy, um, and that just doesn't need to be the case anymore. Less is more. That is the future. Um, we need to be more intentional about what we're doing rather than filling the calendar with things that people should come to and the expectations thereof. Instead, as stepping back from your calendars and asking the question, why are we doing trunk or treat? What do we hope to accomplish with Vacation Bible School? Do we still need to be doing these things? And if so, how can we do them differently in order to engage people where they are instead of expecting them to just get with our program? Because that's just not going to happen anymore. So side by side, um, you can see the next slide. And I will invite you to share what are some thoughts that you have about each of these or even some questions about any of them. Again, these are on the handout that is in the link is in the chat. So um, you'll be able to reference those. And again, I'm always available for conversation. But in the interest of time, we will move on uh, to just some extra things that um, I've been uh, uh, playing like that, that I've been uh, experiencing beyond, you know, since I created those two graphics. Um, and the first one we've already talked a lot about, and it's cultivating trust. Um, these are some practical things that you can do, which is check on people. Um, I've been in several uh, instances where um, people will ask me um, where people are. Why isn't so-and-so coming? And I'll ask them, like, well, have you asked them? Have you reached out to them? Not just when you needed them to do something, but, like, to just see how they're doing. Um, like, as an act of, of Christian love, that is what we are called to do. Um, you cultivate trust and a relational awareness when you care for one another beyond um, an agenda of what you need them to do for you. Um, if you know something that's going on in someone's life, check in on them. Um, be aware of what other people are going through so that you're not just um, contacting them when you need something, but rather as an act of love and care for them. Um, and that will help you in turn know why they're not there. 
because they've been sick for the past month um, and struggling with, uh, you know, care caring for uh, an older um, parent. Um, and so that's why they haven't responded to their emails. Instead, like we we tend to err on the side of judgment and frustration and allow our own insecurities to come into play um, instead of just asking people how they're doing and what's going on in their lives. And then from doing that will help us develop empathy. Keychain leadership is something that's talked about in the Faith Beyond Youth Group. Um, and Caleb's going to talk about that a little more in a minute. Um, but as leaders in the church, um, it is our duty to notice others um, who have the capacity for leadership and the potential for leadership and to create opportunities for them to serve, but also just means giving them the keys, um, help, like just letting go of our need for control and, and just letting them run with it, journeying alongside them, mentoring them and guiding them, but ultimately letting go. I will say that is that has been uh, the hardest thing in youth ministry um, for me because I like things to be a certain way. And I've taught youth over the years, um, you're the ones in charge, you know, and then they will actually like, okay, we want to be in charge, but that means that I'm not. And that means that I have to let go of how I think it should be done and let them lead. That is what they are craving and yet the biggest obstacle is is, the, is us <laughs> and our need to be in charge and our thoughts of how things need to be a certain way. And so if we can let go of that <laughs> and, and let them lead, even if it looks a little different, that's okay. Um, when the CCYM youth decided that they were going to lead worship and, um, and like be in charge of the creative proclamation, I was like, I don't know how this is gonna go, but I'm I'm my whole thing is empowering young people for leadership. So if I don't let go of this, you know, I'm losing all that trust and and that's not being true to my values and who I've said I'm gonna be. We have to let go. Um I'll say another example for that too. Um I, our youth ministers retreat a couple weeks ago. Um, I couldn't be there. And um, fortunately, I'd handed over most everything to lead. But again, the hardest thing about it was not being there and trusting that they they could actually do it without me. <laughs> and they can, and they will. Um, and that's a good thing. We need to celebrate that. Process over content. Again, it's like, it's um, not, are, we may not, in our limited interactions with young people, we may not be able to teach them everything that's in the Bible. We need to just acknowledge that. Um, there's going to be an element of biblical illiteracy involved in today's young people. But what we can do is create a process that inspires curiosity about the Bible to where they want to learn more. And so even though we may not be able to give them all the content, um, we can help create an environment of curiosity and wonder and excitement about learning more so that on their own, um, they will want to to learn more. Um, and then the last one, um, the whole point of the Faith Beyond Youth Group, in my opinion, is that we all just need to be modeling Christ-like character. They unpack what that means in the book pretty well. Um, but um, it's basically young people are always watching you. <laughs> That's a scary thought, but they are. They're watching you. Are you doing what you're saying that you're going to do? Are you true to who you say that you are? Um, are you getting mad at them because they wore tennis shoes the Sunday that they're acolyting <laughs> instead of and just being excited that they're there and willing to serve? Um, modeling Christ-like character, um, showing love and grace um, with our words and our actions and embodying the love of Jesus um, for all people at all times. That's what they're looking at. Um, and so that that's the most important thing that we can do as we journey alongside young people. And so in order to model character for others, we need to be with them. Um, go, I, I know several people, I mean, we have such amazing youth and children's ministers across our conference doing all kinds of amazing things. Um, one of those is uh, Lindsay Robbins at Forest Hill has created a culture where the um, United Women in Faith group and the United Methodist Men's group um, are like a pep club for their youth uh, games 
Um, so when there's like a youth playing a volleyball game, um, the the nine women with faith and the um and the men go to the games and support and celebrate the youth and sit with the parents, and that is such a cool thing. Um, it's not just up to the staff to do that. Like as as our you know commitment um to nurturing young people along their faith, it is our it is our role to to be with them where they are and to journey alongside them. Um, so with that, before we um ask questions and answers i'm gonna give the last word to our ccym president president caleb hello everyone my name is caleb thornton and i'm a senior at wilkes early college high school and i attend wilkesboro united methodist church in wilkesboro north carolina within my church i have many different responsibilities i'm an acolyte a nominations committee member a choir member, a music helper, and I complete various tasks and responsibilities that arise. Outside of the scope of my local church, I also serve as the president of the Conference Council on Youth Ministries. I would like the church to know that my generation does have a work ethic. We go to school, we complete work, we participate in after school clubs and activities, we participate in athletics, and some of us also have a job. All of those things require dedication, time, and work ethic. I may not be able to speak for everyone, but personally, I not only serve as the president of CCYM and have a seat on the nominations committee, I am also the president and founder of a student support group at my school, an athlete, and I am duly enrolled in high school and college. All of those things require a lot of time and work to be able to complete, not to mention the drive and the motivation that it takes to do them. I know that I am not alone in this notion. There are many people in my generation, not only in our conference, but also across the world that have this work ethic and drive. It is my hope that the church will recognize this and allow people to, of my generation to take on more responsibilities within the church. Through my work with the Conference Council on Youth Ministries, I have gathered a lot of firsthand experience and sight of the amazing teamwork and perspective that people of my generation can bring to a meeting. I hope that the church will acknowledge my generation's abilities to do these things and allow them to serve in more serious roles within the church and give their insight and their input in these roles. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. I could not have said it better myself. <clears throat> What questions do you all have or thoughts you would like to share? Again, you're welcome to post these in the chat. As we're waiting for some questions to be asked, I will say that I am available for um, coaching via Zoom, or I'll come to you in person. I love uh, just experiencing where people are in ministry and hearing stories and helping people discern um, some possible next steps. So I'm happy to do that. You feel free to contact me. My information will be on the next slide. <clears throat> uh, so one question is, what's one thing a more traditional youth group could do to improve in this area? A quick win. It's a good question. In which area in particular, just in, in general with all of it? I think a quick thing, not knowing which particularities, um, is to ha sit down and have some conversations with uh, parents about what's going on in their lives. Um, what's going on in your life and how can the church support you? Um, and this isn't going to necessarily be calling a parent meeting where the parents come to you. This might be through uh, and setting up a, a personal one-on-one -on -one meeting with parents, with a parent, and just simply asking, what's going on in your life? Um, tell me about your family and how can the church support you? And over time, um, those relationships will will deepen. Um, this is not a This is not a quick win to answer your question. None of this is. Um, it happens over time. It is intentional relationship development that 
is, is going to happen over time. It is not going to be just a one time thing. But what you can do um, if you have youth coming is to encourage them to care for one another. Um, I, I counseled a group recently who, um, again, the, even the youth were saying, well, we haven't seen so-and-so in a long time. I don't know where they are. And I asked them, well, have you asked them? Well, no. So really reach out, reaching out to people and, and asking not in a judgmental way, where have you been? But more in a curious uh, way that shows that you care about them. Like, I haven't seen you in a while. I miss you. I care about you. And I just want you to know that, you know, I'm here. And I, I have had some youth say that even if they don't respond, it still means a lot that you reach out to them. Um, and so even with, with parents, especially, like, even if they don't respond right away, just continually sending them uh, messages showing that you care um, will go a long way. Um, and then and encouraging them to attend, Adam, again, um, they're not necessarily going to attend something that you do unless you form a relationship with them. So going back to the relationships of all of it. Um, best ideas for scattered Gen Z, young adult, college age, they're even single early 30s, in person or virtual groups, have them lead their own groups for support. Um, yeah, like people are all over the place, right? So a lot of what's happening is uh, the need for some basic community organizing, which again is having some one-on-one -on -one meetings with people um, to see what, what's going on in their life, what kinds of things they might be interested in, and allowing things to... Um, form organically from the bottom up as opposed to what used to be a top down. Ministry used to be a lot easier. You used to be able to just say, hey, we're having a pizza party, show up, and people would show up. It's not like that anymore. <laughs> Instead, it's like, I'm going to bring you some pizza and we're going to sit in the driveway and have a chat. <laughs> um, it's going to where people are. It's um, showing up to a basketball game and just sitting next to a parent. That's the best way to get to know parents and to have some of these conversations is to show up to support their kid at something and to just ha like have a conversation with them while you're, you know, in the midst of all of that. And by doing that, you also get to meet all their friends that are sitting around them. And then their friends around them are like, oh, like, I wish our youth leader would come and, and visit. And again, it doesn't have to be a paid staff youth leader. It can just be that you're a member of the church coming to support a fellow church member. I will say that a lot of Gen Z like to play board games. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of trying to, um, to start things, uh, again, what it needs to be is, is you asking the young people to plan it for themselves. Like, um, hey, I heard you liked um playing board games would you like to help me start a board game night um or hey you know would you you like to get some other friends together to go out for ice cream and let's just talk about life um so involving the young people and planning and leading it are going to be the, your most fruitful endeavors as opposed to planning it for them because they want to be in charge now um, the question also in the chat was, how would you go about starting a relationship with a local high school? Well, I would start by contacting the local high school and saying, hi, I'm Shannon, and I would like to find out more about the school and how I might be involved. What are some of your needs? Um, I'm happy to come and tutor. Um, so again, introducing yourself to someone at the school, whether it's a principal or a vice principal or a guidance counselor. Um, most of our churches have teachers in them. So again, um, being able to identify in your congregation, um, Sally teaches uh, 10th grade science. Um, so, hey, Sally, can we maybe get some teachers together? I'd love to meet them and see what uh, kinds of ways the church can can help. Another way to start a relationship with a, with a local school is to provide a meal for them. A lot of these things are going to be with no strings attached, no expectation that they will come to your church that Sunday morning. No expectation that they're going to show up with money. It's not going to happen. Just a generous act of selfless love and care um, without agenda um, other than just to show love. Um, that's how you That's how you start a relationship. Um, so having a one-on-one -on -one, 
or an email just saying, hey, our church is uh, praying for you. Or um, also it's identifying what your church capacity is. Maybe you have a large space that then the high school needs a large space. Um, and uh, so, you know, again, finding out what their needs are, finding out what your church capacity is to, to offer. And then um, it's kind of like vocation, like finding out where your gifts meet the world's needs, but it's translating that to uh, community engagement. What are your church's gifts and, uh, and capacities for serving? And then what are the needs of the people you're hoping to develop a relationship with? Other questions? Now we're almost out of time. So I'm gonna ask Jonathan to go to the last slide so you can get my contact information. Again, all of the slides for this are in the link in the chat. They're also on the Whova platform under resources documents. So you're able to access all of the slides, all the slides in a handout that has all the links to all the resources that I've named. Um, I took a lot of time to put all the links in there so that you will have access to everything that I've referenced in this webinar. <clears throat> Don't see any other questions, so I'm going to close us out in prayer and thank you all for participating. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for change. Thank you for young people. Um, thank you for old people. Thank you for all the different generations and all that they have to contribute to the world. Um, thank you for calling us to be together in relationship with one another. We confess that sometimes these cultural divides and um, and everything that there are differences that are magnified and we don't know how to relate to each other. So God, we just ask that you will break down those walls and barriers um, that you will humble us and help uh, create spaces for connection um, to where we can get to know each other and support each other and care for one another without agenda, um, and that we can take time to practice holy listening with young people, to hear what their needs are, what their passions are, and involve them in service in the church now, because we need each other to survive. We need each other to be faithful to who you have called us to be. And so God, we just ask that you strengthen us um, and equip us for the kingdom building that you have called us to, because we all love you and care about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great night.